Well, it's been a year since Bloodline of the Holy Grail was published. Those of you who did hear my early talks will know that the book is essentially, as Greg said, about the Messianic bloodline as it's descended from Jesus Christ to the present day. What we did in Bloodline and in talks that we, we did earlier this year it was to just look at the, the way that the Christian church had established itself, how it had molded itself around a certain field of vested interest, most of which was to suppress the female in the church establishment and because the church reigns supreme for only hundreds of years, also in society as a whole. So the question is simply, what was so important about the bloodline? What made King David so important in the first place? And this is the, the trail that I was led on for the next book. And I'm probably about halfway through it now, as Greg said. Um, I'm not going to start the story from the very beginning of it, because what I'm here to talk to you today is, is just about that one aspect of it. The Bible explains that the line that moved through the Old Testament story to King David, etc., was important because it began with Adam and Eve, first people. And if we view it just as we're told it, it's in fact quite a fascinating saga, but there is nothing anywhere in it to explain to us why this line was so special. Quite the reverse is in fact the case. The ancestor portrayed really as a sort of nomadic wandering band of territory seekers who appear to be of no real significance whatever apart from the fact that somebody decided to write up their story. They, they bear no comparison to the great pharaohs of Egypt of time. The only consolation lies in the fact that from the time of Abraham, we're told that these were God's chosen people. And that's a quandary sort of situation, because according to the scriptures, the God who chose them led them through nothing but a whole succession of famines and wars and hardships. And on the face of it, the line not only doesn't look special, it doesn't actually look to have been too bright. <laughs> so, we're faced with a couple of possibilities here. Either, either David was not from this Abraham succession at all, or the story that we've been presented with is quite corrupted from the original tale. The version that we have of the story may be, just like the Christian story, adapted to suit the Jewish faith rather than to suit historical fact. So in consideration of this, I, I was reminded of exactly what had happened with my previous book, with the New Testament story. The Gospels that have been in the public domain for centuries bear little relation to the first-hand accounts of the period. The New Testament was concocted by the 4th century bishops to support the newly contrived Christian belief. What if the Jews had done exactly the same with the Old Testament, contrived it to suit the Jewish belief? From the time of Abraham back to Adam, we have 19 generations in the Bible, and it would appear that the whole of the story of those 19 generations was all Mesopotamian. It was all Iraqi history. I found when researching for Bloodline of the Holy Grail that good sources of background information were the texts that were not selected for the New Testament. Not the ones that are, the ones that weren't. Why weren't they? What did they say that we weren't supposed to know? Perhaps I thought the same might apply to the Old Testament. Maybe the secret here is in the books that were written down at the time from the Babylonian records but weren't ever put into print for our eyes in later times. So I looked for the books that were there but weren't included and, and it's pretty easy to find a number of them. The books of Enoch and, and Jubilees for example with which you may be, be quite familiar. They're, they're currently in print, they're in the public domain, they're just not in the Bible. Other books which I'd known about for some time because I'd talked about it in Bloodline, was the book Jasher. Another very important book. It's so important that twice in the Old Testament our attention is drawn to the great importance of the book of Jasher. It is said and asked many, many times by many people, how on earth is it that this God of the Hebrews, who chose them to be his people, 
led them through trials and tribulations and floods and famines, when from time to time, without a contrary personality, he appears to have done some pretty nice, merciful things. There's a conflict there, a conflict of personality which has never really been understood. Well, looking at the old records, looking at remnants of these two books that are mentioned, we suddenly discover why they weren't included in the Old Testament, because they make it absolutely and abundantly clear that there was a distinct difference between the figures of Jehovah and the Lord. Jehovah is not a name at all. The name to Abraham and the people of the time was El Shaddai. His opposer, the one that was called the Lord in the old text, was called Adonai. And respectively, in the land of Canaan, we find identical stories coming up. They follow exactly the same pattern. They take us through the same sequence of events. They tell the same sagas. And they are called El Elyon and Baal. They mean exactly the same things. El Elyon means mountain lord and Baal means lord. It means Adonai. Two characters still. The definitions of God and Lord as ending up in the Old Testament being mixed together throughout as if we've got one character in this story turn out to be totally wrong. It is a complete concoction of two quite different characters merged into one figure. Hence the conflict of personalities. One was a vengeful God, a people hater. The records are very clear in this regard. The other was a social God, a people supporter. They each had wives, they each had sons and daughters. The writings tell us that throughout the patriarchal era, the Israelites endeavored to support the Adonai, the Lord. All of the early stories tell of them trying to support the Adonai the Lord. And at every step and turn of the way, the Jehovah figure is there, the storm god retaliating with floods and famines and tempests and destruction and just about everything that can possibly put, be put in the way of these people trying to follow the other guy. Now it's during this time of captivity, all of these decades in Babylon as, as the generations lived and died and, and the new ones grew up, that the Jews finally decided that all of these generations of trials and torments and famine and whatever wasn't really a great scene. Maybe we should get on this guy's side. So it was then, and only then, that suddenly we discover that Jehovah is taken on board as the God. And it's at that time that it is said that he chose us to be his people. It's the other way around, actually, but that's the way we get told the story. So the Jews take Jehovah on board as the main God. They decide, out of, out of sheer fear for the peril of everything, that the, the, this is the God they're now going to follow. The Christian church, then, in a, a vague replication of that, eventually takes on the epitome of the same God. It doesn't call him Jehovah, it just simply calls him God, which is... Um, Pretty inspirational. <laughs> and it's at that time that we suddenly find that Baal and Adonai and other names disappear. They are not being followed anymore. What we now have from that moment in time, we've now moved forward into the current common era to faiths of fear. And if one now reads the Old Testament with that in mind, not the English version, the, the Jewish version, a translated version of the Old Testament, and just supplements the names each time. We suddenly find that every time something nasty happens, it is Jehovah, and every time something nice happens, it's this guy they call the Lord. It's not the same fellow. So when did it go? When did we suddenly forget all this stuff? Why was it so important? Why did we suddenly just have people who bled their meat and weren't of much consequence really until later days? It actually happened when their latter-day descendants, whether in the Jewish tradition or in the later Christian tradition, decided to actually start forging history. Not just translating it, but interpreting it to suit a vested interest of the moment. The one thing in the Jewish faith, as in the Christian faith, that's 
absolutely predominant was that any importance played by the female had to go. Not on. This is male stuff now. 